Hello and welcome to News Click. In today's episode of Talking Science and Tech, we have with us Prabhu Prakash to talk about the two uh, recent uh, cyber hacks, major cyber hacks that took place. And uh, these, one of these was on uh, SolarWinds, a US IT firm, and the other was on the Microsoft Exchange server. And both these companies have blamed Russia and China for these attacks. So, Prabhu, can you first tell us about the nature of these attacks, the consequences, and also do we really know who is responsible? Well, you know, the more that the company is saying that Russians are responsible or Chinese are responsible, it's more the U.S. government agencies who have been putting this story, and uh, of course, then these these companies, big companies, are more than happy to say it's not our fault. You know, we were hacked, and somehow being hacked by enemy countries gives them a certain degree of therefore protection to say, we didn't really make a mess of things, we did everything properly, but what can we do kind of thing. If you look at the hacks themselves, this is an area which is increasingly going to be of concern because these are what are called supply chain hacks. What, how do you look at large software platforms which exist today, to which all companies do their work? They're all different sets of components that you get from different places. You assemble it together and then it becomes a part of the deliverables that you have on the platform you have built. Nobody builds everything from scratch. That's not the business that software is in today. Therefore, in a certain platform or any platform, for example, which is complex, which is now being supported by different sets of companies. Therefore, there are a lot of upgrades that take place. So what seems to happen is if one component is upgraded and it is upgraded wrongly, meaning somebody has slipped malicious code into what seems to be an upgrade from an, a server, which supplies such upgrades to different sets of uh, companies or different users, then you are smuggling in under the guise of a normal upgrade. You're smuggling in malicious code. And if that malicious code enters a platform, it can lie dormant for some time. It can penetrate into other networks internal to the company. It can get into infecting other platforms and so on. So you have got something which is seemingly legit now becomes the carrier of uh, really uh, dangerous code, which then can be used to provide a backdoor entry into such infected systems or exfiltrate things out of the system. And both sets of things are likely to happen. Microsoft Exchange Server is slightly different. They had what are called zero day uh, faults. That means there were uh, things that could be used to hack the system, which are not known to anybody. Microsoft didn't know about it. So these are things, therefore, which if found out by hackers, this can be sold for a very high price because then you can hack into the system and there is no upgrade, there is no protection against it, and then you can compromise the systems. So they, the Microsoft's, Microsoft Exchange servers are widely used by small companies, medium-sized companies for as email servers and so on. So those companies that who used Microsoft Exchange servers, and there's a huge number of them which got infected, they actually also perhaps some of them being small, medium-sized, were not so quick to upgrade their uh, software when Microsoft released the patch. Now, one of the criticism against Microsoft was that they were told about this problem, that they had the zero day vulnerability somewhere in January, but they took about two and a half months, more than two months to really provide the patches. And this is where it became public, at least to select people, that there is this problem. It has been flagged by some of some, somebody and it was known among the quote unquote, select people who follow security, that there is a vulnerability, not one, but four vulnerabilities in the Microsoft Exchange servers. And the fact that it took more than two months to supply the patch was a problem. And when they supplied the patch, it became public. And then it seemed to have 
the set, you know, a feeding frenzy among people. You said, okay, there are 250,000 such servers in the world. Let's go and hack some of them and see what we can get. So that seemed to have really uh, expanded the problem quite a bit. So yes, these are critical systems in the sense for companies or organizations. SolarWind, which was the one that we talked about earlier, where this upgrading the software created the uh, vulnerability. Upgrade, uh, for upgrading not as real upgrade, but as a false upgrade. It was uh, hoodwinked into believing it was an upgrade, the system. These, that, that was a much smaller number of servers. I think about 40, 25 to 40,000 systems were uh, compromised, but there were bigger uh, systems. They were in the US government services of various kinds. So they were really into systems which then could infect or the, the propagate the uh, other vulnerabilities into related internal networks as well. So none of these at the moment we know uh, that you know that this is completely cured, everything is fine, there is going to be no such vulnerability ever. That's not going to happen because this is something now we have to live with, that these vulnerabilities will exist and these are standard methods which hackers will use to hack into such systems. The question that you also asked, the related question, do we know who did it? That's the whole issue. If we know who did it, we have to know it in a way that it can be proven. Now, proving that this has been done by country A or a country B or a group A or a group B is looking at the code that has been embedded into the system, the mischievous, malicious code that, is, that you are seeing, and then looking for signatures. Now, the signatures of hacking software are publicly available because this, these codes are routinely hmm, they become public for various reasons. One of them is when you deconstruct the code, of course, you can see the original code. That's how a lot of the software uh, security companies uh, get to know what exactly is happening. So you can look at the machine language code that you have and then try and see to deconstruct what language it was in. And it is possible to do it reverse sort of decompile the software, so to say, so that you can see where, what lag, what was actually written. And from that code, you try then and understand the, what this person is, how does he code, what are the signatures he leaves behind? Does he leave some Chinese characters? Does he leave the, does he give the time and date such that it is, seems to be from China or from Russia and so on. But the problem is that these code snippets are available everywhere. And because they are now widely available, therefore to spoof, duplicate that put into yours in your code is also quite simple. So choosing methods which are known to be Russian, Chinese, or the US NSAs or CIAs or GCHQs is possible for any country level hacking team or even sophisticated hackers. The other big problem that we have is both CIA and NSA's toolboxes have become relatively public. And now we know that NSA, for example, had this capability. This has been uh, discussed among experts. They have analyzed what the NSA could do or couldn't do. And they have said long back, you know, the NSA had the ability to spoof signatures of other country uh, groups. Therefore, that is the other gray area that at the end of it, we do not know who has done it. In, in the fact that the CIA NSA's toolkits are public means those snippets which CIA or NSA would have used are also public. And therefore it's possible that could be incorporated as well. Even if NSA or CIA didn't do it, it is possible for others also to do it. So this attribution as something which one country has declared by itself does not unfortunately prove anything. And that's the big problem in this whole domain that knowing somebody has hacked you does not give you the smoking gun that who has hacked you. Now, so what kind of uh, consequences can the, will this narrative have, you know, of blaming Russia or blaming China? And if this leads to some sort of escalation in these sort of attacks, can this also lead to a physical war? Well, let's get to that a little later because I think that's a much bigger question. What constitutes a uh, offensive 
which can then be construed as a act of war. In this particular case, what we have seen of the Microsoft Exchange servers or of the SolarWinds hack, it is clear that no physical damage has been done. So by the rule book that we have, this does not constitute an act of war. It's a it at best constitutes essentially something which is malicious, done with a purpose which could be simply to take over systems, or it could be simply get information from such systems. So in getting information, unfortunately, it's called spying. Okay, and that's all, all countries do that. That's a business of spy agencies, whether people will like it or not, that does not constitute an act of war. But I think the real question is that, you know, is this something, and that's, that's the question we need to ask, is it something peculiar to Russia or China, or is it something that others are also doing? And here we have the clear, the uh, Snowden revelations, if we had any doubts on the score, that the United States was the global leader of hacking other countries. They not only hacked their enemies, they hacked Russian systems, they hacked Chinese systems, they hacked even their NATO allies. Belgium, Belgicom, you know, was a big uh, internet company which provided support services to even the EU uh, leadership, government, and so on. That was hacked by GCHQ in partnership with NSA. So, public knowledge. There's nothing that I'm saying which is secret. Hmm. That we know, again, that Angela Merkel's communications were uh, listened to by the United States. Going back a step, there was a Swiss company which used to supply cryptographic equipment to countries and uh, governments. And because it was a Swiss company, people believed it was neutral. Now we know that the CIA had actually infiltrated it, bought it over partly. The German uh, spy agency was also involved in it. And both of them jointly spied on 120 countries who used that uh, cryptographic equipment out of the Swedish, Swedish, Swiss company. And in fact, there is enough evidence which shows that they also spied on their NATO allies. They didn't even leave them. So if we look at all of this, suddenly for the US to claim all oh, the Chinese and the Russians are the bad guys, and they are stealing all our secrets. You know, if you go down the route of NSA's uh, leaks, revelations that are there, you will find the spied on Dilma Rousseff, the spied on the uh, oil company in Brazil. So that it was commercial spying, the spied on every international treaty that was going on, the spied on the delegations that came, including the Indian delegations that attended some of these international conferences where, for instance, treaties were being discussed, including climate change. So the US side always knew by all of this what other countries' positions were in terms of negotiations. So all that is public knowledge. So to suddenly claim that Russia and China are doing something very wicked, while somehow uh, the United States and the NATO allies, all of them, or the Five Eyes, which we know is a very potent intelligence tie-up, they're all on the side of the saints, really beggars disbelief. It's a belief of the, that the United States has people have forgotten what happened in the NSA revelations, five years, seven years, people won't remember. Let's start this ball rolling as they wanted to start at that time, saying Russia and China are hacking the world, we are on the side of the angels. And in fact, uh, people's memories are short. So you do see that a lot of the people buying this argument, including that China may have hacked the grid in Bombay. So the Indian government is denied it. The report was put out by some um, small American security company, and it has become now accepted truth that Chinese hack and nobody else does, or maybe at best Russians and Chinese hack, the US does not, you know. So they apparently are all on the side of the angels. This is a reassertion of the Cold War mindset, which is being sought to be introduced. I think the basic issue is what even companies like Microsoft are saying, that if nation states try to develop cyber hacking tools, we are all at risk because this is something we cannot protect against. And we have to have these agencies help us make robust and better software, not hoard our vulnerabilities, use it for hacking us 
and hacking different parts of the world who use our equipment. That is the race that will only lead to a destruction of the global interoperable network that has been built. Then everybody will start to separate and say, let us base, build safe nets. And this is what the United States argument is, that Huawei is unclean. Let's have a clean network free from Chinese uh, equipment. But then what happens when you use American equipment? We know that American equipment means it comes with back doors. The Americans have said it in so many words, so many times. We know it from the NSA documents. We know it from the Switzerland case, crypto AG case, which is exactly what they did at that time. So what makes people believe that while Chinese are bad, Russians are bad, the Americans are good. And that's the key issue that has to be posed. And that's why finally we have to discuss what, how do you prevent a cyber war and how to prevent cyber weapons. So despite the dangers that we see are there, that are clearly there if these sort of attacks are carried out on the level of nation states, why is it that the US has been blocking all attempts to, for a, a disarmament treaty of cyber weapons? You know, this issue of cyber weapons being banned was raised by Russia and China quite, quite some time back. And in 2009, so Russia made a proposal to the United, in the United Nations that on the lines of the chemical and biological weapon treaties, we should have a cyber weapon banning treaty. Now, it's an interesting issue that biological weapons and chemical weapons are easy to make. They're not that difficult. They can be done actually in reasonable sized labs. And it is also true that between what is legitimate chemical activity of a company or a biological activity of a company and the weapons, the differences in technology are not significant. If you want a vaccine, then you do need to do certain set of things. And if you do have the capability of doing certain set of things, then you can also prepare biological weapons. Similarly for chemical weapons, you know, preparing a serene gas as the Tokyo uh, Metro ex example was shown, making was serene was not that difficult. That was what the terrorist group in, uh, in Japan had tried. So these are the basic issues that if we could do have a chemical and biological weapons treaty, which has helped in spite of the Second World War, in spite of Nazi Germany, in spite of fascist Europe, they have held for the last uh, almost now uh, in 70, 80 years. So it is the intent that is important, not that is it verifiable or not. If countries have the intent to do it, then it can be done. So the question that when the cyber weapons treaty was proposed by Russia, the US side actually had two arguments. One was the political argument, which is what they did not present, but that's what they said in private, that we are so far ahead of them, they're not going to catch up with us for the next 10, 15 years. Why would, I, would we give up our superiority as of date? We can penetrate them at will, they can't. They can't do that to us. So this was the same hubris that they had when the nuclear weapons uh, were first developed. They said, we have the atom bomb, we will have the hydrogen bomb, they cannot catch up with us, except for the fact that four years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Russians did, Soviet Union did also have the bomb. So this whole issue that you have an unsurmountable lead for the next five, 10, 15 years, and therefore you don't need a peace, cyber peace, was the argument with which they went into the cyber weapons treaty discussions. And then they said various things. Oh, you know, internet should be free. What you are asking for is going to make the internet fragmented, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They raised the issue of sovereignty versus freedom of speech, all of these issues, and essentially denied the need for a cyber weapon, claiming it was not verifiable, it really wouldn't work, and so on. As I said, the same argument holds good for also biological and chemical weapons treaties. 
The intent was there, therefore it could be executed. The intent is not here, therefore it is not, it was not really agreed to. So now that to, from 2009, if you come to 2021, and we have had the NSA Snowden revelations, we had what is called the Vault 7, uh, which all the CIA tools, what it can or cannot do, is also available. WikiLeaks has made that available, not the code, but what it can do. So given all of that, we know what the United States was doing, why it didn't want a cyber weapons treaty. Now the question is, is that gap between Russia, China, Soviet Union, I mean, sorry, Russia, China, United States, for instance, countries like India, North Korea, huge. The argument is the gap between China and United States has narrowed greatly. There's a Belfer Institute, which is uh, in the United States. They do what is called cyber capacity, the map offensive and defensive capabilities. They're saying China is catching up. And therefore the lead that the United States is not going to be too, there for too long. The question is the ability to create a cyber weapon, unfortunately, is much easier to reach than defense. So it is like chemical weapons and biological weapons. Defense is more difficult, offense is much easier. And again, the, you had raised this issue earlier that when does, when does is this malicious software, when does cyber weapon become a real weapon, which also then be considered as an act of war. And that dividing line, what is an act of war, what is not, is if you damage physical equipment. The only case really that we can unequivocally say was a physical damage was the Stuxnet attack on the centrifuges in Iraq. That everybody agrees was a, a use of a cyber weapon because it caused physical damage to the centrifuges. But if we take this equation out, that now countries are much closer to each other in terms of what the damage they can inflict, not the capabilities they have, but the damage they can inflict. And since cyber weapons are much easier to do, and since nation states have really large resources of high technically qualified teams they can put together, therefore time has come for us to call a halt to cyber weapons. If we don't, then at some point or the other, by misdirection, misintent, not reading the signs well, we can get into a real deployment and use of cyber weapons, and then a real exchange and war could take place. I think that's the biggest danger we face in the 21st century. An unintentional war because of use of cyber weapons and are not being able to understand, is it who has deployed it? Is it somebody just, somebody crazy who has done it? Or is it real? And then of course, you have a war. Don't forget the first world war was caused not by intent, by the countries not being able to read each, reach, read each other well. And you have an unintentional war war that took place. Nobody wanted it at that stage. So I think those are some of the issues we have to think. And how do we get back to the issue of cyber peace? And I think that is the big issue. And talking about how to catch bad guys how to blame Russia, China, and pretend that we are actually just blessed saints who have done nothing ever wrong. That kind of uh, rhetoric and uh, really, uh, what shall we say, propaganda will not lead us anywhere. I think we need to take a cold, hard look on the path we are going. And what you've said is right, that unless we have a program for cyber peace, and that means at the end of it, treating cyber weapons like we have treated biological and chemical weapons, unless we treat that path, I think we are going to be in rather difficult times in the future. So thank you, Prabir, for joining us today on this for this discussion. That's all the time we have. Keep watching this clip. Thank <laughs> you.